Successful crossovers tend to fulfill a wide variety of needs. The best ones provide an additional appeal, something beyond having a back seat more accommodating than a hotel weight room. The latest Honda CRV does just that, but it's missing one thing. This is an impressive SUV, but its value proposition is largely gone. It's about as affordable as I am good at dancing, which, believe me, this is about all I got. Honda does justify the price tag, just not with features. You'll have the standard stuff for the segment. LED headlights and LED taillights with admittedly cool DRLs on every trim. What you won't find here is a front view camera. New for 2024 is the Sport L trim, which now makes for three hybrid and three turbo specs. All electrified models will come with that Sport appearance. The new Sport L just acts as an amenity middle ground between the standard and the touring. For a lot of people, I'd recommend going with just an EX, which gives you proximity unlock and lock and alloy wheels. The base model, which is still $31,000 with front wheel drive, rides on steelies with hubcaps. Move up to the EXL and you'll get parking sensors and a power rear tailgate with the Top Dog Sport Touring making that hands free. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section, but I find the style of the CRV to be crisp and understated. I think it looks like a copyright free Volvo SUV and I mean that in the best way possible. The CRV doesn't offer a superficial off road trim. It was never trying to be a rugged SUV. And the approach and departure angles reflect this, so if you're looking for a ride to take you to remote mountainous areas, I'd point you elsewhere. The interior of the CRV is a tasteful blend of old school Honda and entry level luxury. The things that stand out to me the most would be the elegant look and impressive build quality. The materials themselves are largely plastic. They look nice, but they're even lacking soft touch materials where my knees would rest. But I think there's some nice textures to it. They also used matte finishes and basically all of the areas that you'd be touching. They paid close attention to the clickiness of the buttons and dials. But the panel fitment is good, but the construction of everything is also sturdy. Feels like a durable interior. Something that I think a lot of people will appreciate. I think this straightforward layout paired with a good view outward reminds me of an older Honda product. Of course, we're also going to have new tech in here, though that too is inoffensive. Here we're going to have a 9-inch touchscreen with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But I find it bizarre that you have to spend $36,000 to get this set up. All the lower trims will have that wired only and get a 7-inch screen. That said, the wireless CarPlay doesn't always connect. The bigger screen here comes with a quick response time. The layout is traditional. The resolution is fine. But the most important thing is that it is easy to use. You also have a partial digital gauge cluster with very little functionality but a nostalgic speedometer. I would also label cabin comfort as a strength. If you avoid the LX grade, you will get lumbar adjustment. The seats here are a little firm, but if you can get over that, they're pretty well shaped with good back support and sufficient thigh support, though features here are pretty average for the class. So if you skip the base model, you're going to have wireless charging, heated front seats, a sunroof, and dual zone automatic climate control. Now, if you get all wheel drive, that's like mid 30,000 dollar range so it better have things like that if you go with the exl you'll add some leather to the mix an eight speaker audio system with a bose 12 speaker unit on the sport touring this sound system provides good punch it's clear at higher volumes for this class it's a great system but i am disappointed to see that the base model only has four speakers so no tweeters. This also, even here at like 41 grand, isn't going to have ventilated front seats or a head-up display. This is also the only trim to get the heated steering wheel, and I think they could have placed this button in a more aesthetically pleasing place. This being an SUV, I'm glad that Honda provides great interior storage, reasonable size door pockets, some great storage here in the center and in the console, and this does feel tall people friendly in both the front and rear. Even with the front seat in a comfortable position for me, I still have knee room to spare, headroom is good, and outside of having enough space for recreational activities like hacky sack, you have a thoughtful design too with 
wide opening rear doors that makes it easier to remove child seats or cargo. You have seats with great support and an absurd amount of recline for a back seat and a crossover. Plus there's standard rear console vents, available rear USB ports. The only small letdown is that you're not gonna have heated rear seats. The cargo area is also absurd. It's freakishly tall and box shaped. There's also lighting that could soil the pants of Christopher Nolan. Unfortunately, the seats don't fold too flat and there's no release for them in the cargo hold, but the overall volume makes this one of the most versatile in the class. Plus with the turbocharged models, you do get a spare tire that's absent on the hybrids. On the road, the latest CRV conjures up most of the best qualities you can find from the brand. So underneath all of this is Honda's global architecture that's shared with the 11th generation Civic, which in and of itself was a revised version of the 10th gen Civic's platform, which is a good thing. They've made tweaks to improve rigidity. They add stiffer mounting points for the subframes, retuned the suspension and steering, added more insulation to reduce noise, vibration, and harshness. Even if that sounds like a bunch of marketing jargon, the results speak for themselves. Standard, you're going to have a 1.5 liter turbocharged and direct injected in line four. This will make 190 horsepower. Honda says for this generation, they've made it more refined. Peak torque even comes in a little bit earlier, making it get to 60 in around eight seconds from what I've heard. From my brief experience with the previous generation, the passing power should be good. Just don't expect crazy acceleration. The 1.5 liter comes hooked up to a traditional CVT. Now what Honda says accounts for over 50% of sales for the CRV is the hybrid powertrain. So this is going to have a two liter inline four cylinder. It's naturally aspirated and direct injected, and they've revised it from the previous generation quite a bit. It's also not all that powerful, 145 horsepower, but when you combine it with an electric drive motor and a teeny battery, it makes 204. Honda has also made changes to how their hybrid system works. You have a motor that primarily acts as a generator and then you have the drive motor. The generator motor switches the gear ratio to get the engine to its ideal power band, while the other motor assists in our acceleration. This does a really good job at playing with engine RPMs to make it feel less like a CVT. And then while it does its shifts, the electric drive motor provides continuous acceleration. And you further improve that natural feeling. This has a low speed direct drive and a higher speed direct drive where the engine is directly powering the wheels. And this pulls off some stellar numbers according to the EPA. And even here in the real world, it's pretty easy to manage 36, 37 MPG. And if you're in town, 40. The turbocharged model pulls in average numbers for the class. Acceleration isn't too shabby either. God, that fake engine noise does not play around. It also seems to know that if I plant the throttle, fake shifting would make it slower, so it doesn't do that. The end result was a very respectable seven second zero to 60, though I should note this does die out when you start getting up to higher speeds. Passing power in this is good, nothing too crazy, though some owners report that if you're driving in mountainous areas and you deplete the hybrid battery and then you're relying solely on the 145 horsepower engine, she really begins to struggle. At 65 miles per hour, this is quiet with wind noise well under control and only subtle tire noise for the class, though the cheaper trims will be a little less insulated as Honda adds an acoustic windshield for EXL onward. But if you get the Sport Touring, you'll get it on the front windows too. This trim also powers four wheels as standard. All others make you choose between front or all wheel drive. This system sends a maximum of 50% of torque to the rear and doesn't appear to do a very good job of shuffling power side to side or getting you over obstacles. This is Honda's real time all wheel drive, not the IVTM system. It does do a good job of preemptively engaging the rear wheels at least and should be fine for snowy weather. The CRV is also rated to tow about 1500 or just a thousand pounds if you go with the hybrid. Now on a mangled Indiana back road, we have one, a pretty nice handling car, but 
to a comfortable suspension. Now compared to like the RAV4, I think it does translate more of the small to medium sized imperfections into the cabin, but that doesn't really bother me as nothing is coming through as harsh. And even over repeated bumps, it's not jittery either. I think for a crossover, this finds a nice middle ground between soft and firm suspension. Wow, this handles really well. Very planted. This is a composed SUV, even when you're hitting imperfections while cornering putting it back into sport, which does sharpen the throttle response a little bit. Mid corner, you can make adjustments and the body motion is well kept. While there's not really any feedback or vibrations coming through the steering wheel, I think it's nicely weighted, maybe a little bit heavy for some people's taste, especially in this kind of segment, but it makes it feel substantial and it's accurate. There's no sort of vagueness on center. I think the only car that it would be a little bit more entertained by on a road like this is the CX-5. And that's really not by the sort of margin that you'd expect. You also do have paddle shifters, but that actually just controls the regenerative braking. So if I downshift, then it increases both engine and motor braking. I think older Hondas were maybe a little bit more light, but this is playful, which reminds me of old Honda. I also think the visibility is the same sort of way. You have very skinny A-pillars, a reasonably low belt line, not a huge blind spot around back, and the windshield is close to you, plus blind spot monitoring comes standard on everything except for the base. And all CRVs will be served with autonomous braking, adaptive cruise control, and lane centering, among a few other things. The new CRV also isn't too bad at crashing if it comes down to that. Now, if we're gonna talk Honda, we gotta talk reliability. So over the last decade or two, the CRV has not exactly been problem free, but the previous generation that this shares a lot of its bones with was pretty good overall. The biggest issue that some of you may know of is the oil dilution with the 1.5 liter turbocharged engine. Now, Honda says they're only seeing this with cars that drive really short distances in cold climates as the vehicle isn't warmed up to its operating temp before it's shut off again. Some blow-by is natural, but with the 1.5 turbo, it was notorious for it. And we saw a lot of reports, especially in the first couple of model years, it dipped down significantly after that. And I also have not heard about that for the new generation. Time is going to have to tell. Some people were also having AC and climate control issues, some electrical issues, including a wiring problem with the mirror that apparently when it failed, you needed to replace the wiring harness. It would cause a lot of problems with the vehicle. These things can be dependable, but they are very complex. 2017 and 18 models were also a little susceptible to injector failure. Lastly, there were select reports of batteries draining rapidly and easily cracking windshields. Overall though, they sell like 250, 350,000 units some years. If you look at consumerreports.com and you look at cars.com owner reviews, these do have pretty high satisfaction rates and overall reliability is strong. Most people aren't running into issues like that. So if reliability is of your utmost concern, the RAV4 may take the lead. And because this is technically still a new generation, other problems could pop up, but I'd still feel comfortable recommending this to someone who really cares about longevity. Now, it would be a little disingenuous for me to say this is a true CRV return to form. However, like the quirky first and second gens, there's more to it than being sensible and easy to live with. Its character doesn't come from some surface level sport or off-road trim. It's derived from the amount of thought the engineers put into this. It seems like they dedicated just as much time into making it practical and efficient as they did in making it desirable. It has an interior that's comfortable, aesthetically pleasing yet satisfying to interact with. On the road, it may not be a box of fun, but the steering is substantial. It's precise and natural too. It goes through corners with composure and retains a smooth ride over most pavement. This, in addition to the CRV's ridiculous versatility and strong predicted reliability, makes it a threat to just about every compact crossover. Yet there's one big catch. You're gonna pay for it. I think it justifies its price tag more than most most, but if you're comparing it to the similarly pragmatic Subaru Forester or the great handling Mazda CX-5, the features for the money are lacking. Plus, markups over sticker are much more common with the Honda. That said, I strongly recommend the CRV if your budget can accommodate one. It takes the nameplates to heights that it didn't even need to reach.
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like to help me grasp the slippery YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more fun, detailed car content without fluff. Check out my Patreon for an additional podcast, and I'll catch you in the next one.